So we've released 11 episodes now, I think, which really isn't that many. We've already closed one client as a result, and we've closed like two months of sponsorship, and we're close to closing a couple more sponsors. Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Confessions of a B2B Marketer podcast. Now, before we kick off, I need you to search Confessions of a B2B Marketer in your favorite podcast listening app. Or if you're listening to this episode right now on an app, please subscribe, rate and review. If you can then send a screenshot of the review on whatever platform, email it to tom at sasmarketer.io and then I will do a 10 minute growth audit i'll record a video and i'll send it just for you which will be a growth audit just of your b2b business i'll try to highlight opportunities or maybe potentially areas that you could improve so please do that now that would be very helpful now in today's episode we're going to be talking to dylan hay now dylan is the founder of hay digital a landing page design and ppc agency just for SaaS companies and we're going to be digging into how Dylan attracts clients, how he doesn't do any cold outreach. He's built this very attractive persona through essentially LinkedIn and content. And so we're going to be digging into what he does there, how he's done that and how that's bringing him clients. And then after that chat, I'll give a quick update on our pipeline, on our client pipeline, and also discuss quite an interesting sales call I had last week that I'll talk about how that was good and why I think it was a good sales call. So before that, we must hear from our first and most awesome sponsor, Document 360. And I will be doing the Document 360 pitch today. Now, you probably are aware the Document 360 product is knowledge-based software that scales with your SaaS. If you're not building out a knowledge base as a SaaS marketer, to to harness that bottom of the funnel SEO organic traffic, then I highly recommend you doing that. But I'm just going to quickly read out a little bit from some Captera reviews that I'm currently looking at. So I have one here saying that the Document 360 team is very open to feature requests and have incredible support. I have another one saying that it's great software and rather inexpensive. And I suggest to everybody that they should try it once. And then another one saying that creating and updating articles is really, really easy and the success team is eager to help. So if you do not have a knowledge base for your SaaS, head to document360.io and claim a 14-day free trial. Now we welcome Dylan to the show to understand how he is getting clients. Thanks for having me. No worries. So for those of you that don't know Dylan, and I would have thought you probably do, I've, oh, me and Dylan have done a few things together, but Dylan has a agency called heydigital.co that you should go and check out now. He's also the host of the SaaS marketing show. And Dylan has, I think this way of, I don't know, this, this really open value adding attitude towards B2B and SaaS marketing that I want to kind of dig into in this, in this session with a focus on how you can still get clients and build your business, but still be like the nice guy that everyone loves. So Dylan, d- does that sound good for this discussion? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I like that. That's the kind of impression that I've given you so far as well. That, that's, uh, that's nice. I like that. The, the nice guy that people love. Yeah. Okay. So just to give context to the audience, can you share a little bit about your your background and hey digital sure yeah of course so um i i come from a i guess i would say like a, a SaaS background myself so to kind of uh, i'll try and give the top level story to keep time in mind too but i set up hey digital um about two years ago now officially was when i like left my job to start hey digital i would say it's only been hey digital that it is right now for the last probably 12 to 14 months let's say um, and as you mentioned earlier on, so we're a PPC and paid ads agency that works specifically with SaaS and B2B companies. Um, but before doing that, I was working for a SaaS startup called Leadfeeder. Some people might know of them, some some may not, but it's a uh, like website visitor identification tracking platform, essentially. Um, was a fairly like early member of the team there, joined when there was about 12 or 13 people. We grew to like 40, 50 people within the first 12 months I was there and was looking after like growth, marketing, sales, like a variety of different 
he says, you know what it's like working in a startup, right? And then before that, I was working at Hootsuite, the social media company in their like enterprise team in the London office. And like before that, some sales experience and, and everything else. Um, and basically when I was working for, when I got the job working at Hootsuite, that was when I very first started to, um, I guess like start to build out my own brand on social and start using social actively because obviously we couldn't be talking to like large corporations and companies about the power of social media if we weren't using it actively ourselves. So it kind of began there. And as I, as I transitioned to start working at Leadfeeder, we, or I personally really started to see the value of building, building like, even though it's small, like building an audience on social and sharing like value with them, appearing on podcasts, doing your own shows, all these other bits and pieces and how that would really help us drive business for Leadfeeder, build my brand out myself too. And within within like 12, 14 months of working at Leadfeeder, I was in a position where because of the small audience I'd built, it was ena- like it enabled me to use that as a launch pad to start my own business. So that's kind of like the real quick rundown of how how we got to or how I got to here today and how I've been how I've been doing this for a little bit of time too. Got it. So a couple of things I want to pick up on. First is that you have the sales experience, which is crucial. If anybody is really starting any type of business, sales is such a crucial skill. Do you, do you think, Dylan, if you didn't have that experience in sales before starting at Hey Digital, the growth of the agency would have been slower? Yeah, 100%. Because like, so I have a co-founder that works with me now, Celia. She sat I mean, you might, might be able to see oh, that. Shout was, out to Celia. <laughs> so she was, um, she was building her own like uh, web design agency previous to us like syncing together. And that was one of the challenges that she faced was like no sales experience and like hated that side of the business. Like loved the delivery side and but didn't enjoy the client facing side. And I think it's like, not to say people can't build a service-based business if they don't have that experience. But I think if you don't, you should probably try and find someone to work with you that, that does. Because for me, for example, personally, my, my strength is like things like this, right? Doing interviews with people, that communication with people. Um, what I'm not too hot with is like the organization in the back end, right? Like the systems, the processes. So I think it's like finding that trade-off, not to say that you can't build out a business with, without that. But I think if you're focusing on a service-based business, it definitely, it definitely helps to have either both of those or one person that looks after each of those areas for sure. Cool. And then the second thing I want to pull out of your intro was you mentioned building social, like social following and exposure on social platforms whilst being employed and then transitioning yeah. out. Was that a conscious strategy? Yeah, that's a really good question. So yes and no, because I I knew that building I knew that building like an audience, building a brand would have a positive impact. Like there's nothing negative that can happen from that, in my opinion. It's only it's only good. I wasn't necessarily building it with the sole intention of then using it to start my own business. It was something that was like one of the one of the thoughts within my mind, but it wasn't like, okay, I started to build with the view of like I'm going to use this to to kind of launch out on my own because at that point I still wasn't sure if I actually like 100% wanted to build my own business or what that would be. I was still like collecting experience, right? Like sometimes I still feel like um, over the last couple of years building Hey Digital, I've learned more than I did anywhere else. But like aside from that, I was still fairly early, like a few years into like SaaS and SaaS marketing. So um, I, I didn't begin it with that intention, but now I totally see it that way. Like I think it really makes sense if you're if you're thinking about launching something by yourself, then I, I don't know why somebody wouldn't go down the route of like trying to build out some kind of audience or community or, or something like that. I, I know that one of the challenges that comes with that sometimes that people ask me about is how do you do that without your like employer being pissed off about it essentially, right? And for, for me at Leadfeeder, I was kind of in a fortunate position where the team was a completely remote team and we were trying to build and grow our brand. So the team that I was working with and joining were fully like in alignment with, hey, if I grow, they grow. If our whole team grow their brands, the whole business grows. It's like everyone watching this, whether it's in your like Facebook group or listening to us, where they'll all know about the success stories of companies like Drift and how they've like leveraged their employees' own networks to then grow the business too. Um, so I think it's something that if you are going to, if you are going to start trying to build out your own brand, obviously it's challenging if your leadership team don't 
don't see the value in that or like how it helps them. So I was always structuring it as like, hey, this is going to not only help me, but it's going to help us as a wider team out too. So yeah, because I know that's something that comes up fairly frequently when I talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's how you pitch it to the to the boss, isn't it? We're, this is going to grow everybody. Now, next, about six months, you did a LinkedIn post where you shouted out three people that you were that provided marketing information that you liked. So there was Dave Gerhardt, who was the XCM of Drift. I think it was Harry Dry of Marketing Examples, and then it was me. And my, I, I'm not going to share the screen, um, but my LinkedIn profile views got an all time high after that post. I, th- I think you got X amount of hundreds of comments, X amount of hundreds, hundreds of likes. So first of all, thanks for that. And it probably dro- drove a shed load of subscribers as well. But how did you get that kind of engagement? Yeah, good question. So um, th- this is interesting. Like I-, I know we're trying to keep this to 20 minutes, so I won't like I won't go too long. But the short answer I would say is like there, there is no quick win. Like I know people like to think there is, but I've been... Essentially, I've been posting not every single day, like not with a consistent schedule, so to speak, but I've been posting frequently on LinkedIn, like my own content ever since I was starting to work at Hootsuite, right? And I can't remember exactly how long ago that was now. I'm just opening up my own LinkedIn so that I can, I can check when I, when I started there. But it feels to me like, yeah, so September 2016, I started at, at Hootsuite. So for like three and a half, four years or four years, I've been actively publishing content, sharing content. I've tried various different things. Like I built a Facebook group a couple of years ago. I've been, uh, I have my own podcast now, the SaaS marketing show, but I had another podcast about social media growth before that. So the, the longer answer is like consistently showing up and trying to build community. But then in the short term, there are of course like various strategies to leverage to help you grow. But if you're constantly trying to do like the latest growth hack or just hack your way to audience growth, that's not what really works. It might get you hundreds of engagements or likes on a post or whatever, but it's not going to keep people around for the long or like build an actual community. And I think that's something that, so my my audience really isn't that large, but the people that engage with me, I feel like I've got some kind of community here now that, and that that's like the powerful element of it. Um, of course there are posts like, for example, that one where I shouted out like you, Dave and Harry, I know not all of the time, but I know with a 80% certainty that if I do a post like that, um, and I structure the copy, well, it's going to do pretty well in comparison to other posts because not that I'm like tagging loads of people. I never do that. So that's one thing. It's like the rare occasion where I mention other people or tag other people, but asking like other people's thoughts and opinions. And if you're asking people for like sharing something that they care about or someone else that they follow, it drives more engagement, right? So it's very strategic. Um, Also, for example, when I left lead feeder, it's like, I, I knew that I could use like leverage my audience to start my, to start my business, to start Hey Digital. I, I handed in my notice at Leadfeed. I had like a four week period where I wasn't allowed to talk about it, say that I was leaving. So I had a lot of time to like prepare, okay, how am I going to approach this? And I did this video on LinkedIn that ended up getting like, I think it was 150,000 views or something like that a couple of years ago. And it ended up driving like a number of sales meetings and got me our first couple of clients for, um, my my business before like from the from the outset from the very first day of leaving so it's all about like yes thinking about building community sharing relevant stuff but then every so often sprinkling something in there that you know is going to work and usually that's like not super engagement bait kind of post but like feeding feeding people's opinions getting them to share what they think about something asking them questions etc so it's kind of that balance of like showing up consi- consistently sharing useful stuff building a community and then every so often sprinkling in something that you know is going to, is going to perform. And it doesn't always work, but I would say like 75% of the time, if I think a post is going to blow up, it usually, like it usually does. Right. Yeah. And I do remember actually on that post of us, you did ask people to suggest their own resources as well. So that was part of the formula. Um, and you, you just started touching upon that. Yes. It's great to have all these likes, views and comments, but how do you, how have you converted that into an ROI? I know you've just, you're in the middle of a 30 day daily live streaming process. Um, how are you then able to take this exposure and then monetize that? Yeah, really good question. So it's taken, it's taken a long time is the, is the first answer. Like at the beginning it was okay. Um, when I first started and I was trying to get super scrappy, it was like, I was leaving my job. I was building out 
Hey Digital. It wasn't even Hey Digital at that point. I was still figuring out, okay, what are our services going to be? What's my pricing? Who am I going to work with? All that, all that kind of stuff. So at that point, any time that there was someone that like engaged with me, commented on something, sent me a message, I would just have a chat with them in like LinkedIn messages or whatever, and then try and get them onto a phone call. At that point, looking back, I ended up wasting a lot of time on calls that I wouldn't do now. But I also, I also learned a lot throughout that process. Now the thing is like just working really hard on, um, I'm, I know that my, my LinkedIn profile is set up in a place where if someone comes through to my profile, they, they check out, like, they see my profile. It's very, very clear about what we do and who we work with. The content that I'm posting has shifted a little bit over the last four or five months to be just purely focused on the kind of content that I think senior SaaS marketers and founders will be interested in or show some, like show some insight into. Um, and then, our like our website, for example, I, I don't want to talk about it too much because we, we just relaunched our website, brand, like brand new. We turned it on yesterday, but it wasn't supposed to get turned on yesterday. So there's still like a couple bugs that need fixing, but it was like better to have it up than have our 404 page up for any longer. Um, but like now building that out too, we're starting to get to the point where it's so clear about what we do that if someone, I don't really have to do too much, right? Like if someone sees my LinkedIn content, they see me talking about SaaS, they see me interviewing cool people within SaaS, they see my headline on LinkedIn. They come through to our website. We're just so clearly positioned about what we like, what we do, and who we serve. So now it's just a case of like starting to scale up that activity a little bit. But that would be my advice for anyone if they are doing content. Like it's super easy at the beginning to get into that challenge of like wanting every single post to go viral, or every single post to have thousands of likes and comments. And I used to play that game, right? I used to post about loads of random stuff just to get more engagement on that post. And I started to learn that actually the engagement doesn't matter. If, if I get three people that like a post or three people that read it, but they're CMOs at like SaaS companies that are within our target revenue size, then the value is there immediately. It's like with the podcast, we might talk about that. I'm not too sure, but I... Obviously, it's great that people listen to my podcast and they enjoy my podcast. But ultimately, every conversation I have is with someone who could be or who matches our like target buyer criteria at Hey Digital. So even if not a single person listened to the podcast, it would still be a worthwhile activity for me. You know, so I think it's like shifting that perception of what value actually is from social content for yourself personally and how you position yourself through that. And it's taken me a bit of time to figure out exactly how I want people to to see me and see us. But now that we've got to that point, it's starting to like pick up traction. Sim basically similar to what you've done, right? Like we were talking about this when we did a live stream on, on my LinkedIn about the value of like just solid positioning and being very, very clear on who you, like who you help and who you work with. So yeah, hopefully that answers that. Yeah, yeah. and of course, let's, let's jump into the podcast for a second now. Dylan and Hey Digital are one of Bcast's first customers. The SaaS marketing show, I think, I think you guys are going to take the number one SaaS marketing podcast. Um, I've obviously done research on this. There isn't that many other, like just focused on SaaS marketing. And I think you guys are already taking that crown. I would love to understand more about the process you have to run the podcast. And as you mentioned, how you can balance the value for the listeners with uh, also bringing on guests that work for you as a business and, and, and how you balance that and, and what's happened with the guests. Yeah, for sure. So we'll start with the purpose of the podcast because I think that's really important. So for me, when I, I've been thinking about this podcast for a long time. I've had friends that have told me I should do this for a long time. And I was just honestly struggling to find the time to dedicate to it. We made a couple of hires at Hey Digital over the last few months are now enabling me more time to focus on these kind of activities. So that was the, the turning point. But for me, there's, there's like two focuses with the podcast. So number one is that I knew it would be a fantastic relationship building and ultimately sales tool. I don't like to look at it as just, as like just a sales tool because I don't want it to sound like I'm being too aggressive with the approach. Because for me, sales really for a business like ours too is like longer term relationships that you have to build. Like yes, there will be people that want to purchase the service immediately, but a lot of people are going to need time to think about it. And um, I'm okay with that. So number one focus was that sales and relationship building. And the way that we go about that is I'm very picky, to be honest, about who I let come on the podcast. I turn away a, like a large number of people just purely because I know who our target buyer is for our agency and the kind of people that it's 
I don't want to sound rude, but like the kind of people that it's worthwhile for me to be investing like an hour of time into and sharing with our audience, right? So it's like, first of all, the only people that come on are people that match that criteria, which for us is like a senior marketer or sometimes the founder or leader at a SaaS company, very minimum revenue of like 1 million in annual recurring revenue because we found previous to that, it's not really worthwhile for them to work with someone like us on managing their, managing their ads for them. So that's the first thing. It's like bringing them on. And then the second focus was um, purely on using it as a, like a pillar piece of content. Like people talk about that, like Gary V pillar piece of content strategy, for example, basically just rinsing and repeating that. So every podcast that we do right now, it's been super like super low budget. We haven't really put too much time into it, but every podcast episode, there's like four or five clips that get created that I share out on LinkedIn, on Facebook, everywhere else. Um, a few written posts that I do, etc. So for us, those are just the two core focuses of the podcast. It's one, bringing on people that match our buyer persona, interviewing them. It's like the best way of getting into a call with someone because there's no, there's no like, hey, do you want to get on a discovery call and learn about our agency? Instead, it's, hey, come on, I'll share your story and some of your tips with our audience um, and then build a 45-minute like, relationship with them just through a natural conversation. And you'll be amazed at how many of those, when, when you stop recording, then transition to, oh, actually, we're looking for some help with paid ads. Like, can we talk about it now? Or maybe like... They'll, they'll come back to us when, when they are ready. So there's the value there. And then the value from content perspective has been, has been great too. And now we're starting to go into the, uh, I didn't even think about this as a revenue stream at the beginning, but podcast sponsorship. So we've been sponsored by a company called Restream for our like live stream series and podcast series for the last nearly 30 days now. And that's going to continue for at least another month, which is awesome. And then there's like a couple other businesses that we're talking to right now about sponsorship for the podcast. So actually for me, building a service-based business. I know everyone's talking about podcasts and people get worried about there being maybe too much like competition and all that kind of stuff. But I would just ignore all of that if you're building some kind of service business or, or a SaaS business, especially if you're trying to get in front of like larger level customer, like enterprise deals, for example, it's a great way to get an easy in to some of those conversations. Totally agree. Now, so we've, we've understood a bit more about your social strategy. Now we know a little bit more about your content strategy. I also want to ask about once you do have these clients that you're working with, what can you do or what are you doing to help get them to bring you more customers? Yeah, that's a really... So this is something that honestly, we haven't put any time into until recently. So I honestly, I didn't feel ready to be asking for referrals until the last few months, just because we were still, not that we didn't have stuff figured out. Like we've always been driving good results for, for customers, but like there was still a lot of stuff that we were figuring out in terms of like building out our team, making sure everyone in the team is like really well aligned, real high quality. There was a point where we were working with like a couple of contractors, for example, who were, who were great, but they weren't fully committed to like us and our business, right? So it was like me managing some things, contractors managing things, etc. Um, and because of that, I didn't necessarily feel comfortable enough to be like pushing for referrals. If, if a client was like super happy and they made one, then great, but we weren't doing anything else. Just recently, this is something that we're starting to focus more on. So now, for example, a few things that we do that are actually working pretty well is like every proposal with a potential new client, we talk about that as well. And we add something into the proposal deck about it because you also never know the amount of times that, that like, you propose something to someone, they don't go for it now. But then if they have a friend that asks about paid ads for SaaS, for example, they can find our deck in their inbox and talk to us about that. So that's one thing. And then with like current clients, it's something that we're just like gradually easing in. So we've started doing these um, every, every month we send out like a, an MPS form to all of our clients to find out how they're feeling about things based on the responses that they give it will then ask them if they feel comfortable to make a like referral or who else should we be talking to kind of thing. Up until that, up until this point, that's, that's basically been all that we've done. It's something that we'll start to build out more on. Got it. So it's like a monthly reminder to refer, even though you're not directly asking for it. If you say, would you be prepared to give us a referral that kind of gets the thought in their minds? Yeah. It's basically like we have this MPS thing that asks them a couple of questions. And then when it asks them about like how happy they are or how, you know, the typical MPS question of like, how likely would you be to recommend this to a friend or a colleague or whatever? Basically, if they give like a nine or 10, then it triggers a like flow about like, okay, who, who else do you know that we should be speaking to within the space? Or who else is like interesting within the space even? So yeah, that's, that's something that we've started 
started fairly recently. Cool. Okay. So if, if I was a, an early stage, either B2 service or B2 SaaS founder who's looking to grow like a, a sales pipeline based on content and social and referrals, how, how would you suggest that someone would start? Yeah. Honestly, I'm not just saying this because of you with Bcast and like me with our podcast too, but I've seen the value of podcasting has been like wild for me over the last, like, so we've released 11 episodes now, I think, which really isn't that many. We've already closed one client as a result and we've closed like two months of sponsorship and we're close to closing a couple more sponsors, which is like based on lifetime values of, well, even if we look at that client that we've closed, like a 90 day initial agreement plus the sponsorship, it's like, in the tens of thousands of euros in terms of return, right? And most of our clients stay with us for, for a long time too is what we've seen so far. So like for, for me personally, that's just from the immediate ROI from deals closing. That's not taking into account, like if I go into my LinkedIn analytics right now and look at all of the people that have seen my posts as a result of clips from the podcast and everything else, like the value there is is huge. So I would, I, I would probably go down that route because you really don't need a lot. Like I know that we've got these like nice mic setups and, and everything else, but you don't need that to, to begin. Like it would be good to get yourself some kind of external microphone, especially if you're doing like audio only, like just get some good audio and then, and then you're good. I think, as I said earlier on, even if, if you're trying to use it to build pipeline and create content, it literally doesn't matter if no one listens to the podcast. If it's just you and your guests, like there's still, there's still value that you're going to get out of that. And I think it's going to be much easier than like an early stage SaaS founder or like early stage um, salesperson in SaaS company who's really trying to send, I don't know, like two, 300 cold emails every single day or something. And they're fortunate if they get one reply. And even if they do, like we tried cold emailing when I first started because I was trying to be scrappy, right? And it's like, okay, we closed a few clients from it, but they weren't the right clients because they weren't looking at the time. It's just like right time, right place. There wasn't really any intent there. Um, and they didn't stick around for, for a long period of time. So, um, whereas if you're going through like a relationship building process through a podcast, positioning yourself as an expert, also using it to learn a lot about your target customers. That's the main thing that people can be using these podcasts for too, not just sales, but like if you're early stage, you need to really define who your, who your ICP is, who your target customer is, right? And a podcast is also a great way to do that just by getting them on the show and asking them questions. So for me, I would probably, I would probably go down that route because it's not... I don't find it super time intensive either, to be honest, especially considering the return that you get off the back of it. So that would be my, that'd be my suggestion. All right. Thank you, Dylan. Um, I was just on the new site. It is looking fresh. Uh, it will be linked. The new site and a link to the SaaS marketing show will be below. Everyone needs to check that out. Dylan, thank you so much for coming on and being so honest about your experience and your skills. And of course, if anybody listening needs landing page slash PPC, heydigital.co and yeah, just jump on a call with Dylan and, and see, see where you get to. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Tom. It's fun, fun doing this. Okay. And thank you so much, Dylan, for coming on to the show. That was super interesting, really valuable for anybody who's looking to build out their profile in the B2B space and ultimately generate customers and clients. So I want to give a quick update. Our sales pipeline for the service, so we have a podcast growth service for B2B businesses. The sales pipeline is looking pretty strong. We we added three new clients in the month of April, but we didn't add any in May and now we're in June. I'm expecting we should, and touch wood, and I may be wrong here, but we could add another one to three clients in June. So that would take us up to between seven and nine companies that we are running or producing their podcasts. And so why do I think that's happened? I think really just consistency. We started to see some inbound sales calls or sessions booked from companies that have come through, that have somehow heard of SaaS Marketer, come through, read a case study, joins the email list, and then email number seven. So on day seven, after you sign up, you will get an email where I'm essentially outlining more about the process and then kind of requesting that you either send the link to book a call to someone that you know in the B2B space or booking it yourself. So we've had a few through there. And as you can understand, somebody who has booked a call after they have read 
and absorbed your ethos and your uh, and has gained value from your content is obviously that's going to be a much better sales call. So I actually had a sales call last week, a couple of days ago, and the person on the sales call was responsible for marketing for this SaaS business, but the CEO had sent him the link to book the call. And so I assume the CEO had somehow found the SaaS market case studies, uh, I assume had consumed some of them, and then when they received that email, they forwarded the link onto the person responsible for marketing. And so obviously that's, that's a great setup for a sales call. During the sales call, we, I spent a bit of time to understand him, the business, and what their challenges were. And it turned out that it seems that the service would be a good fit for them. They were not currently fully aware of how to best sell their product. And often the best way to do that is to talk to a load of your customers. And you can talk to a load of your customers by interviewing them on a podcast at the same time as building those relationships to either partner or potentially even bringing them through the sales process as well. So it seemed like it was a good fit. And actually, at the end of the sales call, the marketer who has a separate blog also offered first to write an outline of the service and then post it on his blog to get the backlink back to SaaS Marketer, which was incredibly nice. And so it was just an absolutely beautiful sales call. Maybe they'll become a client or maybe they will not, but uh, I guess we'll find out in the next couple of weeks. But the whole experience was great. And I guess that shows the power of B2B marketing. If you're ever going directly cold, trying to book sales calls, that probably never going to be as enjoyable or as fruitful as that. And so it's just really good to see that after three months of posting case studies, recording these podcast episodes, that suddenly, well, not suddenly, but now the, the market is starting to understand the value that we can bring and is filtering through into monetization. So after all this upfront investment, hours and hours of time and thousands of dollars in creating the content, we're finally bringing the people down through the process and monetizing them and the bottom through that is great to see. Now, of course, I'll keep you guys up to date on that deal and how the, the sales process continues to evolve along with how Bcast is also evolving at the same time. I haven't talked about Bcast on this podcast for a while, but things are moving. There's going to be an exciting announcement that we will be able to reveal in the next six weeks. I can't say much more than that, but things are progressing. We have around 20 monthly subscription customers. So after we launched last month, that not explosive growth, but slow and steady. So that is progressing pretty well. And in terms of the SaaS marketing metrics, I think I covered that last week, but good growth in May. Uh, June is also looking pretty solid. I want to thank you guys for supporting on this podcast and also on the blog. Remember, if you are able to write that review, send me the screenshot at tom at sasmarketer.io and I would do a 10-minute growth audit. I'll record a screen share video where I'll dig into your site, dig into your sales process and try to uncover some opportunities for improvement. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. That rating review, please send Tom at sasmarketer.io. That's Tom at sasmarketer.io. Thank you so much for listening.